about how our country and our European allies are going to, what they're going to do after Assad gassed his own people in that chemical attack and how we're going to respond. There's several things that are actually happening that are leading us to believe there could be strikes within the next 72 hours. Yeah, well, it happened on Saturday. The president has not uh, done anything yet, but he's meeting with his officials to come up with a plan. And the word is early, the Pentagon is very risk adverse, and they're not coming up with an aggressive enough plan that's going to be significantly bigger and better and more effective than a year ago, where only uh, a day or two after we hit them with 59 tomahawks, they were flying out from one of the main uh, one of the main military uh, military installations right. that we had bombed. So this time they want to hit comprehensively. This time they want the French and the British involved. They do, and it looks like the United States and France are positioning warships within range of Syria within uh, bombing range. The targets uh, this time it looks like they're going to try to destroy the chemical weapons storage facilities in Syria that are known they are not going to try to push Mr. Assad out of power. Now, it sounded like when the president talked a couple of days ago, it was going to happen at any time, but the Pentagon was not ready. Uh, today, they're going to deploy another, uh, the Harry S. Truman Carrier Strike Group from Norfolk. Uh, that could be positioned in, uh, over in the Western Med very shortly. Also, mm -hmm. air traffic controllers are telling airlines, hey, be careful of the eastern Mediterranean because there could actually be an airstrike that could impact your yeah, flight. Just to remind you, Mediterranean is under Greece and it's right next to Syria and next to Israel. And so, we, if we send if we send carriers into that area, um, you're right. Europe is saying to the air, air traffic control, it's called the Euro Control. They're saying, be wary. There could be a sudden missile strike if mm -hmm. you're a pilot flying in that area. About an hour ago, a Russian ambassador uh, to Lebanon hopped on Hezbollah television, which I don't get on my cable system, and I got to demand How do you know it. This, then? I'm not sure. Uh, it says. Uh, he says this to us. If there is a uh, strike, uh, th there are missiles coming from Americans. We will go after those missiles and then go after the source of those mm -hmm. missiles. Mm -hmm. So the Russians are saying you better not. What, what Syrians are doing is moving all their assets as many as they can to a Russian installation. What we should be doing is telling the Russians we're hit. Every Sy Syrian military base is a target, and if you're there, it is your problem. Well, also they got about 40 planes. We have a lot more. President met yesterday in the White House with senior defense and military mm -hmm. leaders. He posted a picture on his Twitter page showing that uh, all of them in the Oval Office. I'm right. sure he there's the picture asking them for their advice. General Jack Keane, he says we need to hit them where it hurts. Listen. Listen, Iran, Russia, and Syria, they are pariahs in international community. We have got to go after them in a very public way, condemnation, sanctions, and drag them in to the international criminal court. I mean, it will make no difference to Assad and no difference to the Iranians, but it will make a difference to Putin. His public image is very important to him, particularly at home. We got to really go after these guys in a public way. Right, and that's one of the reasons uh, why Russia has called anything that we do, uh, perhaps an illegal military venture, but I'm a little confused because I remember the Barack uh, Obama administration said they got rid of all the chemical weapons in Syria. So why are we now going to later today or tomorrow or the next day going to do everything we can to blow up their chemical depot? How, and how about what happened at the UN? Yeah. Nikki Haley, the UN Security Council is saying let's just investigate what happened in Syria. Guess who vetoed that? Russia. One country, one of the main countries can veto that and then it can't happen. Russia said no way. Nope. That's because just going to start. Happened. Never right. happened. happened. Syria right. didn't do it. All right. All right, five minutes now after the hour. Yesterday, the big story of the afternoon was about a five-hour grilling or informational session between Mark Zuckerberg and Zuckerberg, as well as uh, in front of uh, the Senate. Today, he goes in front of the House. Yep. The question is, he was really extremely well rehearsed, in my estimation. Uh, he have referred to his team countless number of times. Does he? Did he answer the question about our privacy? Did he answer the question? And it's a tough one. How you deal? What you deal? Uh, what you? deem hate speech and what you right. deal political speech in which you don't like he was unable to answer a few questions or have you ever taken down a liberal uh, a, a liberal pundits right. remarks or a liberal causes uh, information well, here's the thing he's in the hot seat because time and time again Facebook has screwed up in their entire history they keep screwing up he admitted they've screwed up many times 
every time they say, yep, we screwed up, we're going to do better. Well, now, because nothing ever seems to happen, uh, Congress is ready to regulate. And I'll tell you what, if you saw Ted Cruz yesterday grill uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, you, you were probably cheering because you're going, you know, we never see this kind of interaction where you've got somebody from the political right actually with one of these big tech companies holding him accountable for the fact that through the last number of years. How many times have you heard that uh, a big media company like Facebook has shut down conservative points of view? Well, Ted Cruz had had enough and let him have it. Listen. Facebook has initially shut down the Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day page, has blocked a post of a Fox News reporter, and most recently blocked Trump supporters Diamond and Silk's page with 1.2 million Facebook followers after determining their content and brand were, quote, unsafe to the community. To a great many Americans, that appears to be a pervasive pattern of political bias. I understand where that concern is coming from because Facebook and the tech industry are located in Silicon Valley, which is an extremely left-leaning place. And uh, I, this is actually a concern that I have and that I try to root out in the company is making sure that we don't have um, any bias in the work that we do. So he's saying California is a very progressive state. So what is he going to do about it? Are you going to move the headquarters? You're going to hire more conservatives? Well, he was saying perception. No, he, he, said, he said no. He said the perception uh, from conservatives is because we're in a liberal place that will, will, will be unfair to conservatives. And there's a reason for that. I mean, he came here and he briefed a select number of people at Fox about his point of view and uh, vice versa, what kind of business deals they tried to set up. But I, I get really concerned. I don't know if there's an answer. He says it's going to be artificial intelligence that's going to be able to siphon out hate speech or dangerous speech. We know Al-Qaeda and ISIS, we want to kill you. That's got to go. But what about stuff that's pro-life? What about stuff that's, you know, uh, pro-abortion? What are they going to decide what is hate speech? What about if you're pro-gun? Is that hate speech? Why is it every time uh, Facebook takes something down, it seems to be from the political right? They got to do a better job. He said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, a million times yesterday. Now it's time to see whether or not they actually do it. Apologize right. for the Russian meddling in the election. Apologize yeah. for censoring. Apologized for um, scraping your info. A lot of your info yeah. getting out there and getting public, and for spreading fake news. All there right, stunning news yesterday. Michael Cohen, the embattled attorney, the personal attorney of President Trump, for decades. Uh, we know that his uh, his office was raided, his residence was raided, temporary one, four uh, four places overall. They took out a number of important items, including taking the cell phone out of his hand. After the FBI opened the door, they put their foot in the door, grabbed his phone, and went through his offices. In a stunning turn, I cannot believe this, Michael Cohen decides to speak with Don Lemon of CNN, by far the most anti-Trump network on the planet, that includes MSNBC, and speak with Don Lemon, who is a great guy, but it couldn't be more anti-Trump. What was Michael Cohen doing, speaking to Don Lemon about his innermost thoughts? Don was asking him what happened. And he said the FBI was courteous and professional and yeah. respectful. And he said he was unhappy. He was worried. He was upset. And, and he said, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Do I need this in my life right now? No. no Is that absolutely. a message to President Trump that I'm turning, that I'm flipping? Uh, I, I don't Doubt see it. that. No, uh, he but protects that. Protects apparently, uh, they were for looking for information into payments made to a Playboy Playmate and that porn star and apparently some connection. Michael Cohen, as it turns out, owns 32 uh, taxi medallions here in New York City. Really? Yeah, That's so big bucks. Every one of the taxis has to have an, uh, a medallion aside from the list. 32? The Aren't they each like a million dollars each? They used to be a million dollars each. So he has uh, 32 of them. Uh, apparently, according to the New York Daily News, he owes $53,000 in back taxes, according to a state website. So anyway, it, <laughs> get another my, loan. This is not the <laughs> Mueller investigation. This is the a uh, U.S. attorney from the Southern District of New York looking into this kind of corruption. Alan Dershowitz takes a look at all of it, given the fact that he's been the fixer for the president for so long. For this guy to be in this kind of legal peril, it's a problem. It's a dangerous thing to start intruding into lawyers' offices. It will make it much harder for people to trust their lawyers, their doctors, their priests, their spouses. When people will say, look, even the president's most confidential communications with his lawyer can now be searched just based on probable cause, which is a very, very low standard, I think there'll be great distrust 
of relationships that are very important to American society, confidential relationships between a priest and a penitent and a doctor and a patient and a lawyer and a client. That's not a good day for democracy. Alan Dershowitz had dinner with the, at the White House last night, was invited over. I'm sure it's a lot to do with uh, his legal expertise and his feeling on this. He said, I feel the same way if it was Hillary Clinton was president and they were doing it to her. I think it's, this is a really uh, critical time because it almost seems like the media is pushing the president to fire Rod Rosenstein, Postine, uh, pushing the president to fire Robert Mueller as if they're saying, please create a constitutional crisis. Clearly, the president feels ill served. Clearly, the president feels boxed in. Clearly, he is irate and he's trying to get some type of strategy together while trying to handle this Middle East crisis yeah, uh, and everything else. Apparently, uh, Mr. Dershowitz had been scheduled to be there. Uh, it has to do, the, the dinner had to do with his uh, work at, with Middle East peace. That's what he said, but I doubt it. Well, that's what he said. So, yeah. uh, so there. But uh, no doubt about it. Uh, and we had a guest on yesterday said that uh, Jonathan Turley said that this is all being done as bait. Go ahead, Mr. President. Look what I'm doing to you. Uh, fire somebody and blow yourself up. But from everything we've heard from the White House, while they say he's got the authority, doesn't sound like he's going to. Well, here's the thing. He's also reevaluating, according to a report about an hour ago, that he, whether he's going to sit down or how he's going to interact with Robert Mueller, if at all. Does this change the calculus as he feels pressured? Also, there's a report of a second person turning on Paul Manafort about what he's doing. So uh, if you're trying to pressure the president and his inner circle, you're doing it. Mm -hmm. But still, no collusion. And that was the whole idea in the beginning. All right. Uh, 12 minutes after the hour. A Fox News alert now. President Trump weighing his options to respond to Syria. The U.S. warships are heading to the region right now. Our next guest says we are past diplomatic recourse. Lieutenant General Richard Newton knows what we're capable of. He'll share it. Plus, we got an exclusive look at protecting our border from the water this time. Sir, were you trying to cross to America? <laughs> Brett oh. Jenkins asking that question. He goes out on the front lines with the Border Patrol. On kittens, bright copper kettles and warm woolen mittens, brown paper packages tied up with strings. These are a few of my favorite things. Last year's ad campaign was a success for ChoiceHotels.com. Bada book, bada boom. This year, we're taking it up a notch. So in this commercial, we see two travelers at a comfort inn with a glow around them. So people watching will be like... Fox News alert now. Tensions with Syria heating up in every way since... And form the U.S. deploying armed nuclear powered aircraft carriers to the Middle East, including the USS Harry Truman, following Assad's alleged chemical attack on his own people. Saturday, is this the right course of action? Lieutenant General Richard Newton serves as the Assistant Vice Chief of Staff for the U.S. Air Force and joins us right now. First off, uh, General, great to see you. Uh, this would be your branch that's going to be heavily depended on uh, to inflict the damage. Does it bother you that we've waited uh, since Saturday to act because word is that Syria is moving their assets? to the Russian bases. Uh, good morning, Brian. It's uh, good to be with you again. Uh, not, not particularly. I believe that the, uh, the president has been huddling with his uh, national security team, particularly his uh, U.S. military leaders, and certainly with Secretary Mattis, uh, to go over a range of options uh, that could be as, you know, uh, simple as what we did with the 59 TLAM strikes, the Tomahawk land attack missile strikes we did back on 7 April 2017, to a more robust air campaign. Uh, so I believe it's, uh, uh, it, it's uh, appropriate and certainly suitable for the president to go through these range of options and for the military planners, the Pentagon planners in this case, to provide them those options and, and get forces ready in place to uh, strike as the president uh, presumably would, uh, would call for. So we want to get the French and British involved. No word from the British. The French are leaning our direction, but fear mm -hmm. of escalating this conflict. Uh, how important are they, besides actually helping us, the fact that they're with us? 
I think that's very important. Uh, and I, my, my sources tell me that the, the British Royal Air Force could be a, a player as well. But as you mentioned, Brian, the French Air Force uh, as part of a, a broader coalition, which will make it a different uh, and more robust uh, approach uh, than we did, uh, again, back last April when right. you and I had that conversation last year. So uh, I think you'll be looking for more of a, a coalition strike. The key in this is, is not necessarily this strike is very important, obviously, but also what's going to be the strategy behind it. Right. Uh, because what, what happens, happens if they're the doing it again line? in a week? Do we hit them again in a week? And obviously they were using well, that air base right. days after we bombed it last year. Meanwhile, this morning, the Russian ambassador hopped on Le uh, Lebanon, Lebanese TV and said if there is a strike by the Americans, then missiles will be downed and we'll even go to the source of those rockets. So they're saying, don't do it. And if you do it, we're coming after you. What's the American reaction? I believe the American reaction is, as the president has led this effort, is to, uh, as I would say, stand tall in the saddle. Putin only understands power. The Russians only understand power. They'll respect that. Uh, again, though, if you look at a, a panoply of options that the president has, I believe it'll be more robust than it was last time, rather than maybe just a single strike, uh, more of a, a prolonged air campaign over a couple days using coalition forces. Uh, but one thing also to, that's very important is to consider, as G General Joe Votel, the commander of the U.S. forces in the Mideast of U.S. Central Command, said last week, that uh, we've got to look at you know what's ahead of us. That includes all instruments of U.S. national power. Power, diplomatic, economic, financial, and certainly military. Uh, we've got to allow uh, U.S. Uh, our, our tools, such as the civil, uh, civil, uh, you know, programs to provide for stabilization and so forth, mm -hmm. are very important that we follow on uh, with this effort. Not just what's going to happen near term, but long term as well. All right, uh, General Richard Newton. Thanks so much. My pleasure, Brian. All right, we'll talk to you as this uh, action actually gets into place. Meanwhile, straight ahead, remember the school that armed its teachers with rocks? Now one district is stepping to the plate with a new line of defensive baseball bats. Do you feel better now? Plus, Mark Zuckerberg grilled for hours on Capitol Hill over Facebook's failures. Will this change anything? Our equipment cleans like no one else's. Alert. More than 100 people are dead in a devastating military plane crash in Algeria. The jet packed with troops going down shortly after takeoff near an air base in the African nation. No word yet on what caused the crash. It's unclear if anyone on board survived. Another California city joins a lawsuit against the state's sanctuary law. The city of Orange voting overnight to oppose the bill, which limits local law enforcement from cooperating with federal immigration authorities. Orange joins seven other Orange counties county cities that oppose the bill. Meantime, Virginia's Democratic governor welcoming illegal immigrants with open arms. Ralph Northam vetoing a bill to ban sanctuary cities in the state. Let's look at your headlines. I'll send it back to you. Thank you very much, Jillian. Thank you, Jillian. Yep. All right. Well, today on Capitol Hill, Mark Zuckerberg is gearing up for day two in the hot seat after senators pressed him on Facebook's failures to stop hate speech. You may decide, or Facebook may decide, it needs to police a whole bunch of speech um, that I think America might be better off not having policed by one company that has a really big and powerful platform. Can you define hate speech? Senator, I think that this is a really hard question. And I think it's one of the reasons why we struggle with it. There are certain definitions that, that, we, that we have around um, you know, calling for, for violence. I agree, it's hard. Fox News contributor Tommy Learn joins us right now live from Los Angeles. Tommy, uh, Facebook uh, CEO who started it in his dorm room years ago. We heard that about 50 times. He admitted they had screwed up. He promised to do better. Will they? Um, you know, I don't think they're going to change anything unless we pressure them to do so. But I got to say this about Facebook. Many of you know that I made my career on Facebook. Mm -hmm. If not for Facebook, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you three today. So I owe a lot to the platform. It allowed me to reach millions of people. And in turn, I generated millions of views. And actually, Mark Zuckerberg likes my page on Facebook. So I have a love-hate relationship with the platform. But I will say this. My page is large enough that where if they censor me, I can generate some controversy mm -hmm. and I think I can correct the issue. Other conservatives are not so lucky. Conservatives with smaller pages, conservatives that are outside of the media industry, they're censored by Facebook al algorithms day in and day out. You just saw it with Diamond and Silk. So it's up to us to put the pressure on this company and hit them in the pocketbook. What if these conservatives that are generating millions of views for you, what if we suddenly just stop? Then what, Mark? Mm -hmm. What did you think about the testimony? Because it looked like in the beginning he was probably terrified, and then he realizes, I went to Harvard. 
I've got this. But it was interesting that he's sitting there talking in front of the Republicans, many of the, of the very ones that he's tried to silence, or at least his company has. What do you think of the overall uh, scene yesterday? It sounded like he didn't know a whole lot about Facebook and being that he's a CEO, that's probably a little unsettling. But again, he can't define what hate speech is. And we've seen the left do this time and time again. They consider hate speech to be whatever they don't agree with. Exactly. That's what they consider to be hate speech. They throw the labels, they throw the categories at us, and we're silenced. We have to fight back. We have to get vocal. And we're going to do it on platforms like this, and we're going to do it even on his own platform. I know I will. The way I understand it, I think it's going to get even harder. Number one, it is true. He's right. I don't know how you stop hate speech. Al-Qaeda, ISIS, we get it. Uh, you know, uh, the KKK, we understand it. But when you start going into what this site means or what this site means, uh, if you just let it all go, it's the Wild West, which is probably not anyone's advantage. I also think this, when he said I'm turning it over to artificial intelligence in the future to decide, you know, what's going to come forward and what's not. So now it's going to go to an entity that doesn't exist that we created that's going to weave and comb out what we're going to be watching. That's a little scary. Yeah, more algorithms, and that's not good for anyone. Mm -hmm. And I would also encourage Mark Zuckerberg to hire more conservatives within the company. Outspoken, honest, genuine conservatives. Maybe he'd get a different perspective. He surrounded himself with people that don't think exactly like he does. Exactly. Whoever uh, designs the next algorithm is the one who's going to essentially determine what hate speech is. Meanwhile, let's talk a little bit about this. We've been talking about the midterms. Harvard did a poll, and it looks as if a wave of young Democrats outnumbering young Republicans Republicans by two to one could wind up going to vote if they do vote uh, in the next election. What do you make of this? And how do Republicans capitalize on the fact uh, that, that uh, you know, everybody likes the tax cuts, but at the same time, a lot of the people who are benefiting are Democrats? Well, two things. Republicans, conservatives, independents, we have to do a better job of reaching out to young people. In the past, we have failed. We don't reach out, we don't go to college campuses, we don't speak to these, these young people, and we need to do a better job of getting our message across. We tell horrible stories. The left is excellent at messaging, and we're not so great. So that's what I've really dedicated my career to, is reaching the young people. So I think we need to do a better job. But second of all, do not underestimate the whisper voter. The whisper voter exists in young communities as well, who are afraid to say to support this president who are afraid to say that they're conservative, but they are, and they're probably going to vote conservative as well. So let's wait and see. I uh, didn't trust polls in the 2016 election, and look where we are. Look who's in the White House. There you go. The polls were wrong, many of them. All right, Tommy, thank you very Thanks, much. Tommy. Have a great week. Great to see you. <laughs> All right. Up next on Fox and Friends for this Wednesday, an exclusive look at protecting the border from the water. There. Were you trying to cross to uh, America? Griff Jenkins on the Rio Grande with the Border Patrol. You're going to see that live next. All right, plus this graduation photo has a lot of people talking. A college senior posing with that gun right there in her waistband and wearing a Woman for Trump t-shirt. She is going to join us live to respond to all the backlash she's getting. All right, uh, plus happy birthday to supermodel Alessandro Ambrosio, who's been on our show multiple times. She's, she was on our show when she was uh, maybe 30. She's 37 today. Are you glad she was born? I'm glad she was born. This is a collaborative, improvisational conversation about politics and life. Everybody at The Five comes with a background and an expertise. No one says news has to be boring. No scripts. Nothing. People love the show because we make them think. And at 5 o'clock, you get the hard stuff and we dissect it up top. And then at the end of the show, we give you a little dessert. We're telling you what we think. And we are speaking, it turns out, for a lot of people. Shot of the morning, an incredible moment here. President Trump taking a moment to pray with players from the University of Alabama Crimson Tide football team at the White House. 
Yeah, the players in president uh, huddled together and bowing their heads in unity while players placed their hands on the president's shoulder. That is something. Uh, that was shortly after the president congratulated the team on their big national championship win. As you can see, they're on the so south lawn of the White House. Roll Tide, 1600 <laughs> Pennsylvania Avenue. Congratulations to that team. All right. Well, there is a 171-mile stretch of the Rio Grande River at the Texas-U.S. border that isn't protected by any sort of a wall. It is absolutely wide open. And as the National Guard arrives this week to help secure the border, our own Griff Jenkins is getting an exclusive look at the mission on the river. He joins us right now from the border in Laredo. Hey, Griff. <laughs> Hey, good morning, guys. You know, it's shortly after 2.30 this morning. We were reminded of the real danger here. We heard a short gun battle going on. We asked the CBP guys on patrol here, said, how often do you hear that? We hear it about every week, they said, and that's a reminder of what these guardsmen are arriving to. So we hit the water to give you a closer look. No. Every single week, we get uh, reports from our partners in the government of Mexico, gun battles, uh, people being killed down to, our, uh, to the south of our border uh, that is at the hands of the cartel, the same cartel that traffics illegal immigrants and narcotics across our borders through this area. The mission of the boats is to, uh, to patrol the river, uh, to make sure we have that, uh, that constant presence. There's just tons of people. Some are standing on the banks, some wave, some are fishing. How do you know who intends to come across? How do you differentiate? They might be there scouting, waiting for us to, to pass along the area, and then that's when they'll make the move as far as crossing either uh, individuals or narcotics across the river. Sir, were you trying to cross to uh, America? Agent Contreras, we rolled up. What was happening there? So you had uh, two individuals that were attempting to illegally enter the, the U.S. by wading across the Rio Grande River. We actually had agents already up there waiting for them, so that's what kind of turned them back. In your sort of estimation here, is this the boats, the land, and the sky? Is it that what stops people from entering? Right, so it, it takes, it's a combination, right? You need personnel, you need the technology, and then you need the infrastructure that's going to give us uh, access to, uh, to the immediate border. The Border Patrol is a mobile force. It is a 24-7 job keeping those vehicles at a high state of readiness so that our men and women can go out there and do that job. That's one of the elements of support that the National Guard can bring to bear. Another element the Guardsmen will bring here is horizontal engineering to sort of clear roads, clear brush, and that will let more green shirts, as they're known, Border Patrol, hit this border and try and secure it. They told me of a gun battle that happened in recent weeks with the Mexican Marines less than a mile deep over the over my shoulder back here. Well, it lasted about 45 minutes going on here, so the threat is very real. That Zeta cartel getting more dangerous and more desperate as the Guardsmen arrive here, guys. Well, Griff, is there a sense they're under Demand. Absolutely. You spend any time with the border, whether I was out near San Diego or all the way over here near Laredo, from end to end of this U.S. border, manpower is the common theme. They need more manpower, and they're certainly getting it with the now 1,600 guardsmen that are being deployed, at least in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. California, I will remind you, has still not yet decided whether they will be part of securing this border. Well, if they're smart, they would. Um, Griff, thank you very much. Great Thanks, report Griff. from the real all right, as the train comes in. <laughs> All right, it is uh, 22 minutes before the top of the hour, and right over there, Jillian's got the news. That's right. Good morning, Good morning to you guys. Good morning to you at home. Let's get you caught up starting with this. President Trump signing an executive order pushing to strengthen or add work requirements for welfare. The president ordering a review of the programs, including food stamps, housing, and Medicaid. He's also calling on federal agencies to enforce current work requirements. Trump says the order will restore independence and dignity to millions of Americans. The CDC issuing an urgent warning to doctors across the country about fake pot likely laced with rat poison. 
So far, three people have died. 100 others have been sickened. The deadly outbreak beginning early last month in Illinois and spreading to Indiana, Missouri, Wisconsin, and Maryland. First, it was a bucket of rocks. Now, another school district in Pennsylvania is arming their teachers with mini baseball bats. Officials in Mill Creek Township say they want to have a consistent tool for all teachers to fight school shooters. It's a last resort. It is the last resort, but it is an option. Unfortunately, we're in a day and age where we may need to, to use them to uh, protect ourselves and our kids. The bats will be locked up in each classroom. That's all. Your headlines. Send it back to you. Okay, they're spending 1800 bucks on them. That's yep. something. Thank you, Jillian. Thanks, Jillian. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, 20 minutes before the top of the hour, turning now to extreme weather. At least two twisters touched down in Fort Lauderdale, Whoa. Florida, as you can see right there, yesterday. Yep, uh, but warm weather is finally coming to the East Coast, so we'll move past that. Really? Janice is tracking it all. Is that true? Is Brian telling the truth? Well, Brian is telling the truth. Uh, the caveat is, is going to be cold again as we head into yeah. Monday, but we'll take what we can get. Look at the temperatures right now in New York City, 38 degrees, 42 in Chicago, 30 in Cincinnati, so still below average, but we're going to put those temperatures up as we go through the rest of the work week. There's the past 24 hours. We do have a little bit of snow across the Great Lakes and a bigger system moving into the Northwest and the Rockies that's going to bring the potential for heavy snow very heavy rain across the coastal areas and then that system is going to move eastward not only bringing the threat for snow but severe storms large hail damaging winds isolated tornadoes for friday the threat across the central u.s and then the fire danger is also high as we go through the next couple of days so wildfire danger and there there's brian uh speaking the truth on friday and saturday with temperatures in the 70s good Fantastic. job brian finally 77 on sunday <laughs> All right, Jamie, we need to thank celebrate. You. No kidding. All right. Uh, meanwhile, take a look at this. This graduation photo has a lot of people talking. A college senior posing with a gun in her waistband and wearing a Women for Trump T-shirt. There has been a lot of backlash online. She will respond to that in about five minutes. Plus, did you know your taxpayer dollars are actually funding sanctuary cities? One congressman is trying to change that. He's next. <laughs> 